Okay, so let me pull up my script, um, okay. which will explain a lot of uh, stuff to the audience. And it's going to be really obvious that I'm reading this, and I apologize, but I don't want to mess anything up. You all ready? Yeah. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Kenyon Review Virtual Reading Series. My name is Elizabeth Dark and I'm an Associate Director of Programs here at the Kenyon Review. This afternoon we are honored to be hosting a virtual reading with Marcelo Hernandez Castillo and we are grateful to all of you who are joining us for this event. In a few moments, Kenyon Review's Poetry Fellow Molly McCulley Brown will be introducing Marcelo. Marcelo will then read for about 20 minutes and then we will have a Q&A time with Marcelo. You as an audience member do not have access to chat right now. We cannot see you. Um, we cannot hear you. Um, actually, I can see your names, but they, <laughs> they can't. Um, but if at any time during the reading you would like to send a question, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen and I will receive that and I'll be collecting them throughout the reading to then uh, bring to Marcelo at the end of the reading. Uh, we might not be able to get to all of them, but we will get to as many questions as we can. Uh, Molly's also going to join us for the Q&A um, as a third uh, conversationalist. And before we begin, I'm going to try to use my share screen feature in case at any point you find that you want to purchase a book written by Marcelo. I'm hoping that you can now see my screen. Um, let me back out a little bit. If you go to the Kenyon Review page, kenyonreview.org, and then um, hover over events, scroll down to reading series, you will come to our reading series calendar, uh, which includes a list of all of the virtual readings that we're doing in the next few weeks. Uh, but at the very top, you'll notice uh, KR Bookshop. If this were here on campus, uh, our bookstore would be in the back re, uh, selling uh, Marcello's books. But since they aren't and we aren't, um, we've created this bookshop. And if you click on it, you can go um, to this page, which uh, directs you toward how to buy the books. And all of the books of everyone in our virtual reading series are listed here for you. So please consider that. As we move forward, um, okay, and now I'm going to mute myself. I'm going to mute Marcelo, and uh, Molly, I'm going to let you take it away with an intro. All right. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Molly McCulley Brown. Um, I'm the Poetry Fellow at the Kenyon Review, and it is a pleasure uh, to be here to introduce Marcelo Hernandez Castillo. Because the birds flew before there was a word for flight, years from now, there will be a name for what you and I are doing. I've been thinking a lot lately in these strange and brutal times of these lines from the title poem of Marcelo Hernandez Castillo's first collection. The motion and meditation they contain and their simultaneous knowledge of the limits of language and faith in its capacity to evolve and make sense of what might now seem unfathomable, unnameable, perhaps even unknowable. The writer Carmen Jimena Smith wrote that Marcelo Hernandez Castillo's poems celebrate and reveal the contours of physical and historical intimacies, a feast for the eyes and heart. This is absolutely true, and it strikes me that maybe we've never needed such poems more. Marcelo Hernandez Castillo is a poet, essayist, translator, and immigration advocate. He is the author of Senzontle, which was chosen by Brenda Shaughnessy as the winner of the 2017 A. Pollen Jr. Prize, published by BOA Editions in 2018, and which won, among other things, the Northern California Book Award, and also of the memoir Children of the Land, which was published in January by HarperCollins and named in Entertainment Weekly, The Millions, and Lit Hub Most Anticipated Book of 2020. He is a founding member of the Undocu Poets Campaign, which successfully eliminated citizenship requirements from all major first po book poetry prizes in the country, and he was recognized with the Barnes & Noble Writers Award. He has helped establish the Undocu Poet Fellowship, which provides funding to help curb the cost of submissions to journals and contests for undocumented writers. A graduate of the Helen Zell Writers Program at the University of Michigan and the Canto Mundo Latinx Poetry Fellowship, he has also received fellowships from the Vermont Studio Center and the Squaw Valley Writers Workshop. 
He teaches at the Ashland Low Residency MFA program and teaches poetry workshops for incarcerated youth in Northern California. Please join me in welcoming Marcelo Hernandez Castillo. Hi, everybody. I'm not sure who is exactly out there or how many of you are out there because I don't, I can't, I can't see that. All, all I can see is the screen um, of me reading, which is kind of weird because it feels like I'm just reading to a mirror. Um, and it is indeed a strange time to have a reading. Um, I hope you are all staying safe, staying, um, keeping your social distancing and um, staying as door as much as you can um, for those of you who can. Um, you know, it, it, every conversation that I've had with some friends recently uh, that started a, week, a few weeks ago that we picked up again, feels like it's been a different conversation. We can't have the same conversation anymore. Um, given uh, you know, the state of the world right now. So I don't know where that leaves poetry. I certainly wrote this book, you know, far before any of this happened. All of these poems are far before any of this happened. Both of my books are far before any of this happened. And all of this is so new though, even though it feels like it's been, you know, 10 years since we've, since, since the beginning of the year. Um, I don't know what that means and what that's gonna do to, to books, to poetry, how poets, artists are gonna respond um, because they will, we will. Um, and, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be interested in seeing what comes of this. Um, but certainly pretty terrified, uh, I won't lie. Um, I try to keep my hopes up and I try to encourage my family around me to keep their hopes up and um, find ways of keeping themselves busy. Um, so yeah, I hope your mental health, uh, you're taking care of your mental health um, and trying to find ways to, um, to, I mean, I don't even know what the word is, but again, thank you all so much for, uh, for being here. If you are out there, I'm gonna be reading from my book of poems, Sensomple, uh, which is part of the GLCA New Writers Award uh, tour. Um, this stop is my Kenyan, Re Kenyan, Kenyan College um, stop. This week I would have gone to Denison and Oberlin and uh, forget one more, um, but I'm really happy to be here with uh, Kenyan College and the Kenyan Review. Uh, very grateful for them hosting and accommodating, um, making adjustments for this. So I'll open up by reading my first, the opening poem titled Sensomple. I don't normally read the epigraph, but um, lately I've been thinking about it. It's by Jean Toomer. It says, emptiness is a thing that grows by being moved. Sensontre. Because the bird flew before there was a word for flight, years from now there will be a name for what you and I are doing. I licked the mango of the sun. Between its bone and its name, between its color and its weight, the night was heavier than the light it hushed. Pockets of unsteady light. The bone, the seed inside the bone, the echo and its echo and its shape. Can you wash me without my body coming apart in your hands? Call it wound, call it beginning. The birds be twisted into a small circle of awe. You called it cutting apart. I called it song. This is almost more terrifying than reading in front of 100, 200 people because I can't get any feedback. And usually I read the room for um, how, how I'm doing and you know, how long to go or which poems to read. Sometimes I change um, on the spot, given the kind of audience, given what I feel in the room, but I have nothing here. 
it's uh, it's very very strange to only have my poems here um, existing me and my um, small batch of onions that I'm growing next to my window to keep myself busy. With that said, next poem is titled Webback. After the first boy called me a webback, I opened his mouth and fed him a spoonful of honey. I like the way you say honey, I said. I made him a necklace of the bees that have died in my yard. How good it must have felt before the small village echoed its grief in his throat, before the sirens began ringing. How follow their scripture. Perhaps we were on stage, which meant it was a show, which meant our only definition of a flower was also a flower. I waved to the crowd like they taught me, like a mini miss something. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I could have ripped open his throat. I could have blown him a kiss from the curtains. I wanted to dance by myself in a dark room filled with the wingless bodies of bees to make of this our own old testament with all the same beheaded kings pointing at all the same beheaded prophets. The same Christ running through every door like a man who forgot his child in the car. But the lights were too bright. I couldn't hear him because I wasn't on stage. I could have been anyone's idea of pity. How quiet are prophets. Let my bare back remind him of every river he swam in. Nil and meow. I pulled the bees off the string and cut them in my palm. I told him my Spanish name. There was nothing dry on my body, the lamps falling over in the dark of me. Um, what a lot of people don't stop to think is that all of this stimulus uh, talk about the stimulus check that's going to be going around um, isn't going to be available for folks who are undocumented. Um, I've heard somewhere that it might be, but it's not too definitive yet. And yet, you know, these are the people who are essential workers right now, um, picking their fruits, um, working in restaurants, um, you know, providing for a large portion of the U.S. population. Uh, and I feel like that conversation has been um, kind of left off. So with that said, I think, um, as I said I would, I usually change. Um, I think I'll read this one. And it's in the voice of my mother, who, if you have read my um, memoir, Children of the Land. I talk a lot about her and her experiences working in the field um, to kind of just shed a light on those who are there um, risking a lot for not much pay. Esparto, California. Each pepper field is the same. In each one, I am a failed anthem. I don't know English, but there is so little that needs translated out here. For 12 hours, I have picked the same colored pepper. Still, I don't know what country does death belong to. My skin is peeling. Cuál Dios quisiera ser fuente. If only I could choose what hurt. An inheritance. The lost, those lost mothers bound to the future of their blood. 
I am walking again through the footage where the white dress loses its shape. Even moving my hands to sort these peppers is a kind of running. Hold still. Our child will sing because I was once her flag. She will take my picture, both groom and bride, a country she has never seen. I will give her the knife to make her own camera, the gift of shade and water, the likeness of a star to possess. And I'm only half sick if being sick is just a bone waiting to harden. I could be a saint, since there exists no pleasure that wasn't first abandoned to us out of boredom. We traffic in these leftovers of ecstasy. How lonely and inventive those angels were. If I could speak their language, I would tell them all my real name, Antonia. And with my curved knife, I would rid them of all their failures. So um, after being gone from the U.S. for 12 years, um, after having been deported, my father was finally able to return under um, some really extraneous conditions. Um, this was still in the previous administration towards the end of it, at the very end, otherwise he wouldn't even be able to be here. But I have a very difficult uh, relationship with him and understanding uh, what bridges my son is going to make between he, he and I, or what bridge I serve between my son and my father. It's called sugar. My father's hands split peaches in half and fed me, mouth and nail, salt and a little piss, always the leather, always my ass bleeding with welts, my ass purple with love, always the belt he called Daisy. And I said, hello, Daisy. And she said, hello. And he bent over the sink with his palms in his face. And he, the only tunnel of song for miles in any direction. The white belt. Daisy and Daisy and Daisy. And after it's over, we know we have both become men. Him for the beating and me for taking his beating. I love you, Daisy. My father's hands will love a man at the first sign of weakness. I am weak, therefore, I gather that he loves me. Their suffering was our suffering. They peeled the skin off a lamb which was still breathing. I remember its cry, but not the birria we made from it. His hands were two doves courting the lamb, which was also a dove in its thrashing. They cut through the air like ghosts. They were large and capable of great things. I always came when they called. They always had peaches to put in my mouth. Um, not to, again, I don't know who's still there. I don't know if, how many of you have logged off already? <laughs> Listen to the first few poems and left. Um, I hope you're still there. I hope that um, these virtual readings, which I've seen a few um, from other poets who they have done. Um, <laughs> okay, I just got um, And I really enjoy them. Um, it's much different to see not just the like the home lives of the poets and writers that I've, I've heard um, because they're broadcasting from their living rooms, from their kitchens, from their office. Um, 
but uh, the intimacy, I think, is a, is a lot, um, dynamic is a lot different. So this is uh, the poem, Essay on Synonyms for Tender and a Confession. And shout out to Canto Mundo, um, because this poem was written during the, my workshop, my second workshop in 2015 um, in Austin, when they had it there in Austin. And this is the only poem that I've ever written, I think, um, in one go. And basically never uh, went back to it. And that has never happened since. Um, it had never happened up until then and it had never happened since. So I'm grateful for my Canto Mundo Familia. It's for Sandra Maria Esteves, who was the uh, workshop leader. Essay on synonyms for tender and a confession. Color it all blue. My father and my father's father and his Marcelo, Marcelo, Marcelo. And all of us in one suitcase that hasn't been opened. I haven't been opened. And I say to my father, I want to be all pink for one day to name each part of me after the names of my mother's lovers, to throw my head back and dance like someone pretty, or just hold the shame in my hands. And sometimes this doesn't stop me. My name, a 200 year old word for please, as in, Please let me open the suitcase, as in, please let me play whatever is inside. And sometimes my name talks to me. It says, you ain't shit. It says, I could send you flowers, but what's the point if they will still be flowers when you get them? It says, even the priests are lonely. It comes to me as one priest confessing to another. Marcelo, I want the red dress and to throw my hair up real beauty queen style. If I'm lonely, put the bright birds back in their cages. Marcelo, I'm not ready to be dipped in water like you, like a father. And so I opened the lid and held each flute inside like shattered glass. But there was no song. There was hardly any glitter. And the priest who is no longer Marcelo, and the flute which is no longer Marcelo, and the lover who is. I don't know what it means to name a child. When he said my name, I opened his eyes. I played the song. Neither of us knew how it ended we would have paid anything at all to make it stop. Um, after reading this poem, I, and then prefacing it with the Canto Mundo um, backdrop, uh, I realized how many other uh, connections to people in my life there is here. There's a line in here that was a tweet that I sent to the poet Eduardo Sicorral on his birthday. Um, I think that year I told him, I, I could send you flowers, but what's the point if they'll still be flowers when you get them? Um, and I never mentioned that, but I think being more comfortable here in my house, um, instead of like, you know, in front of a podium or something, reminded me of that. Um, and of all the dancing that we had. Any beer only to help war. This will be the second poem that I finish with um, before I read a small excerpt. Um, oh, and my Mac battery is low. Um, so I need this real quick. Um, I guess I should have anticipated this, but it'll only take one second. Thank you for your patience.
Clean the moon. I've never made love. I've never made love to a man. I've never made love to a man, but I imagine. I imagine pulling the moon. I imagine pulling the moon out of his brow, pulling the moon out of his brow and eating it again. Eating and pulling his hair in silence, a kind of silence when the moon goes out, when the moon goes back and forth between us, a kind of silence lit for only a moment, seeing for only a moment through the eyes of the horse, through the eyes of the dead horse that burns slower than my hair, my hair that burns the moon off, my hair with a hand inside it. And this is the last poem from Saint Sontle. It's um, the shortest poem in the book, and it's the one that was added at the very end. Um, it's instructions, how to grow the brightest geranium. I'm not ashamed, the story goes. I swear I will learn to leave a room without touching every part of your face. So that's in something. Um, right now, I would imagine uh, if we were in an audience, some applause, but um, I kind of like the quietness. Um, so for those of you, just a little back, uh, a brief background to this section. Um, my mother returned to Mexico uh, after being here in the country for decades, almost 30 years on and off, um, because she was just tired of the immigration system, tired of waiting, tired on Congress uh, uh, to see if Congress will do anything, um, just tired in general. So um, she went to uh, go live with my father while he was still over there deported. And this is leading up to her departure. I moved back in with her to help her make that transition. Back in her house, I brushed my mother's hair, which was soft and thinning. She started dyeing it for the first time. Maybe that's why I felt so light through my fingers. She always loved her gray hairs, said it made her look refined, dignified but not anymore. We sat on her couch late at night, watching a Spanish dubbed Steven Seagal movie on Telemundo. Her arms were small and I could feel her sharp bones angled at the softest parts of her. I rubbed oil in her hair and kept brushing as we both laughed at Seagal, those quick action camera angles and the infamous ponytail whipping back and forth. The explosions in the background 20 years after the movie had been released seemed faded and uneventful, as if by now, in our dim room's Telemundo version, they were only pointing at fire and couldn't actually burn, as if they were only saying bang, but were muted. And Seagal knew this. He was indifferent with his emotionless face perhaps already aware during filming of the dim and fuzzy filter he would be seen through 20 years later in a dark room where a boy who was hardly a boy anymore was brushing his mother's hair. It was as if he knew that his voice would be replaced by the voice of a man speaking in a heavy Castilian Spanish who had difficulty expressing surprise when a bomb exploded in his O's and ahs, and which sounded more like sexual soft moans. He didn't bother opening his mouth much to speak. She never had many knots in her hair, but I continued to brush. It wasn't defeat that was growing in the air with each week. It was exhaustion. It was easier to brush her hair than to tell her I would miss her. I knew she would never return. Could we be blamed for giving up? There was an abscess growing on her arm from a car accident. 
It looked like a golf ball on her wrist and it forced her to become left-handed. I remembered her being mad at me as a teenager saying, don't make me hit you with my good hand, her left hand. It didn't hurt when she hit me, but I had to pretend that it did. What hurt most was the fact that she hit me. The fact that she could, um, the fact that she couldn't hit me with her right, the fact that she had to adjust her body sideways to hit me with her left, and that I stood there unfazed, angry that I couldn't go out with my friends. The fact that it didn't hurt, but I cried nonetheless. She was hit by a drunk driver. Papa was driving and they were T-boned on the passenger side, Amal's side. Papa walked away from the crash unharmed. The hood of the car sliced open Amaz's neck. The right side of her body shattered. Abbas said he saw the car coming and just before impact, he swerved left without thinking. I wonder how much time he had to choose which way to turn, his side or Amaz. It's funny how those things happen. How one person can walk away without a scratch while the other is nearly sliced to pieces. If the lights were on in this room, and if I were looking at Ama for the first time, I would notice the remnants of that accident, the scars running down her neck, and the ones on her shoulder where small pieces of glass were still tucked just beneath the skin, and yet lodged too deep to extract, too large to dissolve into the rest of her. The largest scar ran down the length of her forearm, where they opened her and replaced all the, metal, all the bones with metal. The metal would stay there, but the glass would not. At least not all of it. The doctors said the shards would come out by themselves. Unexpectedly and years later, with minimal pain, like a slow bullet traveling out of her, like a bullet in a film with an already outdated actor looking directly into the camera as he recites one offers. Like, I'm a bad motherfucker. I imagine the glass making its uneventful entrance into the world two decades later, as if it were alive, squirming the way snakes do when they come out of the shell. Maybe it would be a lonely affair. No one there to see it except Amma, who would surely be confused at first, seeing something leave her body. Or maybe I would be there to witness this thing that's been part of my mother's body for so long that it could be mistaken for bone. I wouldn't know how to hold it if it fell in my hands. I would put it to my ear and listen. I would hold it to the light before giving it back to Amma so that she could know what it was that hurt her every time she lifted her arm to hit me. Thank you so much. Um, so I believe now the format is going to be opening it up for a, a brief discussion. Uh, compiled with some Q&A from people logging in as well as people who have sent it in before. Yes. Uh, yes, hi. Hi. <laughs> I need to tell you while I try to figure out how to get my camera back on, um, I'm getting a lot of clap, clap, yay, thank you, um, finger snaps. <laughs> so everyone is very happy right now. Yay. Um, Okay, there I am. Let me grab Molly as well. Uh, hopefully she will come in the room. Thank you so much, Marcelo. Uh, that was fantastic. And I really do wish, um, there, there are very good reasons to not have the chat feature uh, live right now, but toward the end, I really wanted you to just be able to see all of the, the people thanking you. So I'm going to start actually with, um, a couple of comments that are just that, they're not questions. Um, Susanna from Argentina, living in Toronto, Canada, says, we're so grateful for your beautiful words, Marcelo. 
You're doing fantastic. We are all in this together and your poetry is making everything better. We need so much miel, miel, gracias, amigo. Oh, that's, that's great. Uh, and then Alexis says, Marcelo, I just want to say thank you for sharing your work with us. It means a lot to hear a fellow Chicanx academic sharing such personal experiences that are written so beautifully. Much love, sending you the best. Stay safe. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you for reading those. Uh, yeah. And I'll, oh, another one. Uh, Cassandra. Hi, Cassandra Brown. Marcelo knows you. Great reading. Thank you, Marcelo. In case no one else asks, is there a new poetry book forthcoming? Uh, <laughs> the poems are slowly, very slowly coming. Um, yeah, I don't know what to do with poetry. Uh, like, I don't know how to approach poetry uh, as easily as I did with Sensible after having written the memoir. Um, not for like, because like, you know, I want to like write prose for forever now, but just because um, it's a lot harder. So, yes, it will come. I have the base to have kind of like some ideas, but it's, it's just such a grueling process. Connected to that, uh, we have a Kenyan Review associate who points out you've written books of poetry, but you've also written a memoir. Where do you find similarities and differences in these genres? Um, pauses, I think, and by pauses, I don't mean to say that that's a uh, difference. I feel like there was a similarity. Um, obviously, when I read the prose, it reads more narratively and I read it faster. But uh, nonetheless, um, I found that what I was wanting to do in Sensontle with blank space to kind of emphasize pauses with syntax working against meanings to, um, you know, either uh, parse up the line, speed it up or slow it down. Um, I felt like I was able to do that also with prose, even though line breaks didn't really matter, but there was still sections that um, were in and of themselves an entity, a piece that um, could stand alone. And I feel like that was a, a uh, unexpected similarity that I thought would have been a difference, but in fact, it was a, it was a similarity. Um, and I guess the, the difference was, was time. It just, since only just, you know, that's all I had and all I had been working on for years and years and years and years and years. The oldest poem is from 2018 and it got published in, um, first poem is from 2008 um, and it got published in 2018. So um, just the uncertainty of it, if it would ever be a thing, if, um, if it would ever be a book. And with the prose, uh, I had that deadline. I had a year and a half to write it. So I didn't have the luxury of putting it off or, you know, um, of thinking about it more. My decisions had to be more, more on the moment. And I think, I think it helped, um, I helped that. So I have a, I have a follow-up question um, to that, uh, Marcella, which is just uh, as a, a poet who's also been working in prose and now is trying to figure out how to transition back, um, I'm wondering if there are, um, are there are there there possibilities that feel more present in one genre or another, or did you find yourself sort of gravitating toward different things in one genre or another? Um, I'm struck by hearing you talk about this surprising similarity, but I'm wondering whether you did find differences in the in the experience. Yeah, I think it had to do with subject matter. Um, with with the book of poems, I will I was able to be more surreal and abstract about the things that I needed to say. And um, when it was a moment in my life when I could not, uh, I could not be vague anymore. 
or I could not write poetry anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I began writing about more directly, you know, my um, the experiences growing up in the prose. So um, yeah, for me, it has more, and it's it's probably not a good thing to to uh, have the content um, lead the genre um, or be the decisive factor in the genre. But for me, that was the case at least from the jump from Sinsondre to um, Children of the Land. Uh, but now moving forward, you know, I really don't want to uh, force something to be, say, a poem if it's not ever going to be a poem and I'm just going to waste a year or two trying to make it into a poem because people expect me to come up with another, either another book of poems because I'm primarily a poet, but I see myself as a writer, you know. Um, uh, I'll take some night classes and uh, go to uh, journalism school. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm reading a, uh, 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 I don't know what the name of it, a, uh, a script for a movie, a screenplay. Yeah. Um, that somebody asked me to take a look at just to, um, to give them their their feedback and I told them I have no idea I have, I, I have no idea the conventions of screenwriting I have no idea he said that's fine you know as long as you get um, the ideas behind it so I'm open I just don't want to box myself into thinking that I have to produce another book of poems next that or that um, you know a memoir isn't going to be the next thing for sure <laughs> But there is a project that I have in mind that I might be a um, more um, investigative uh, uh, journalism piece on a project that I have in mind. Awesome. Uh, another question from an associate here at the Kenyon Review. Um, has translating the work of other poets affected your writing? And if yes, in what ways? Yeah. Um, I always thought I knew Spanish until I had to translate it. <laughs> and then I realized I don't, I don't know Spanish at all, or at least it, the the act of writing the word on paper because um, I didn't have much practice um, writing, just writing in Spanish, um, you know, writing in my journal in Spanish, or even filling out forms for my mom when I was younger in Spanish, um, there wasn't too much exposition there. It was just like either yes or no, name, date, uh, address, and so on. So when I started translating and uh, kind of like thinking Spanish, it was the first time that I wrote certain um, words in Spanish and it, and, it, and it just like freaked me out because it was like having the mind of an, of an adult but the surprise of like a kid, mm. it, it was kind of like a, for me at least, um, and still is because I still encounter certain like phrases that I have said a thousand times in Spanish when I talk to people, but um, when I translate them and write them down, it just turns it into a whole different experience. And I think that especially um, has, has made me, um, reconsider a lot of the choices that I make in, in, in my writing. Um, and whether I want to, um, what direction I want to, I want to approach, you know, the Spanish in my writing, whether it's um, including the Spanish without any uh, context and uh, expecting my reader to pick up on that and, and to do the translating themselves or um, providing the context but still having it in Spanish um, all these questions that um, that kind of are around um, the, the workings of the relationship between the two languages. But definitely, um, I'm definitely really, it's really, it has really affected me. Um, a professor has written in, uh, my students discussed your decision to frame several poems in your collection as plays or television scenes. Um, for example, musical in which you and I play all the roles and nuclear fictions. 
Can you talk about the choice to write about your experiences in your relationship as an immigrant through that frame? Yeah. Um, surprisingly, I don't think I've ever been asked about that particular aspect of the book. I've been asked about the popular cultural references. And, you know, there's, there's, um, lines by Lana Del Rey in one of the poems that I read, um, the essay on synonyms poem. Um, and there's a lot of references to, um, like kind of like the, the the TV family, the, um, uh, like this heteronormative 50s uh, nuclear family, um, and how that plays into, you know, my idea of assimilation and the stakes of assimilation and how um, differently that, that was approached by like my parents versus me, um, of the, the first generation immigrants. Um, you know, the framing of, uh, plays, of shows, of role playing in general, that the, the title of that poem, poem in, in which you and I play all the roles, um, it's it's the uh, performative nature of those roles uh, and the, the the fluidity of that performance um, that I think I was always going towards. And even in 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 in, in um, Children of the Land, there is references to um, a lot of entertainment, uh, popular culture, late night talk show host. Because um, and this this is directly affected by a, a good, two of my good friends, um, Susie Garcia and, um, and, uh, and Rob Bruno, um, who have really, uh, uh, show, sh have really um, been fun, uh, f foundational in my understanding of how, pop how we can understand ourselves through popular culture. Um, so for me, uh, it's always been that uh, uh, form of acting, but in real life, um, because of the because of the different things I had to do to just get by. Marcelo, I was I was really struck um, hearing you hearing you read, having spent so much time just with the collection on the page, um, with uh, how how musical the poems were read aloud um, and how much a kind of auditory experience of them really deepened um, my relationship to the text. And I wonder, um, do, uh, are the kind of sonics of a poem front and center for you as you're writing? Are you thinking more about it as a visual thing? Are you thinking more about the, the narrative propulsion of it? Like, do you have, what's your sort of, what tends to be the sort of first and the dominant force for you there, and maybe those are different different things. Um, maybe it changes poem to poem. But I asked a friend of mine recently because um, I had a genuine like concern that uh, everybody did this, that I did something that um, was weird, and everybody else was like um, doing something that I wasn't doing. Is that uh, I can't for the life of me remember the lyrics to songs. Hmm. I mean. I will listen to a song a thousand times and some of my favorite albums I have listened, you know, they're my, always on my top end of the year list on Spotify. Um, I was even, <laughs> I think everybody has this already, but um, I was number four in uh, uh, having listened to Lana Del Rey. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, but I still can't remember a lot of her lyrics and I think, so I called up my friend, uh, Derek, who I think is also on, uh, is online here. Um, do you listen to a song primarily because of, as you say, uh, sonically because of its melodies, or and and or because of its uh, lyrics? And you can't say, oh, because of both. It ha you know, it has to be one or the other. <laughs> um, and he said, well, for the tunes, for the for the melody, for the for the music of it, you know the. The lyrics are boring, and it made, it, it made me realize, like, yeah, that's how I also approached um, a lot of the poems in Saint Sondre. And uh, you know, when I'm journaling or when I carry my um, uh, 
uh, my notebook around and something comes, it's always not what it's saying, but it's always uh, how it's saying it. Um, so when I'm reading them, and as, like you say, when you, um, as you were hearing them, uh, reading them, I'm not thinking of anything else in my, literally, there's nothing else in my mind except how to deliver them uh, sonically. How, how are the um, musical qualities of, you know, influxes and how to, um, raise my voice, how to lower my voice, all of that. Yeah. I'm comforted by that as someone who can't write unless she can walk around a room and say things out loud to herself. That is a comforting answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had to speak a lot of things out loud too, but a lot of times I would be in a, a cafe or something, so I'd have to like not speak so loud. So I wouldn't <laughs> look like myself. Just the person in the corner whispering quietly to their computer. <laughs> well, now I think we're all talking to ourselves quite regularly. <laughs> Me. Um, uh, this is a question for both of you since I have two poets in the room uh, and more in the audience. Uh, but uh, the question that we've received is, and I think this will be our last one because we're, we're wrapping up the hour here. Um, and I'm sorry for those of you who didn't, uh, we didn't get to, but this sounds like a good one. Have I said enough? <laughs> Later. How do you feel your role as a writer, a poet, is affecting the way you walk through these days of COVID-19? Um, I feel ashamedly guilty that I'm not more productive than I'd wanted to be. And I think we talked about this a little earlier. Um, walking through the world, either half kind of with this hint in the back of my head that somewhere down the line, this has to somehow figure into um, my work or you know, what we were doing around this time. Um, you know, similarly as other poets, you know, uh, as what happened to poetry, to writing uh, in general after say 9-11, um, how we responded to what the state was doing um, uh, to uh, overseas, um, the atrocities that were being committed. Um, so for me, uh, I'm trying not to let that be the case. I'm trying to, for once, not be a poet, not be a writer, not be um, expected to remember all of this, to detail all of this. Um, you know, maybe I just want to forget. Um, and I don't know if that's the best that here, but later on, if it's going to, show up in your writing, it's going to show up in your writing, no matter what, right? Um, I think you have, I think we have less control over that than we think, um, because that, what ultimately, what drives us to produce, let's say next year, or the next two years, when all of this seems to be a thing of the past, um, we will produce what, what um, in ourselves, um, we find most um, enthralling to produce or more, most obsessive to, to produce. Um, but I can't shake the feeling in the back of my head that I'm expected to say something about this or to say something intelligent about this. I have not, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't know about, I mean, I know about being lonely. Um, but that's about it. I don't know, um, I, you know, we all know about loss, we all know about um, socializing, we all know about these larger things and these larger tropes, but specifically relating them to this pandemic, I just don't know how I will. And so um, I think I'll just say that and say that um, I don't want to feel guilty about taking this moment to kind of reassess my my life, my choices, and um, just 
Yeah, I will say that I have I have I have struggled to to write or to feel like I have anything to say, and and I've even sometimes struggled to to read um, in these in these recent um, days and weeks, and that's that's a strange thing because language is is often um, the sort of easiest consolation um, for me. But it, I will say that one thing I have been able to do, and that has been a pleasure, is um, is to listen to language and to listen to poetry, and so it was uh, an absolute pleasure um, to get to hear you read this afternoon, Marcelo. Thank you so much. Um, it's 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 such a such an honor to be um, part of the GLCA um, for, um, but also to log in and uh, do a video uh, reading. And uh, we have kind of perfectly um, the these are not questions, but in response to your response, um, many thank yous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo, for such a human response. Thank you so much for these final good words. Um, so I will let those be my final good words too. Thank you, Marcelo, for, for working with us and being our first virtual reading series event. Uh, thank you, attendees, for showing up and listening and asking questions. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, this is a highlight of my week for sure. Um, so everyone, please be well, rest, and keep reading. Nice. All right, stay safe. Thank you.